So, Dave, why don't you just start by introducing yourself and who you are and what you do here in Boulder. My name is David. I been a street performer here for the last 21 years. And what's your show currently? Um, I'm popularly known as the Zip Code Man. And it's a show that combines memory act, juggling, and storytelling. And it's a show that I've been performing on and off for 21 years on the Pearl Street Mall at 13th and Pearl in Boulder. And um, is this just, let's just start here with your show. How did it become what it is today? Could you just kind of walk us through well, its evolution? Well, I, um, I left New Orleans in 1991 to move here. And in New Orleans, I had a juggling act in the French Quarter. And, and I had a tall unicycle. We juggled fire torches. And the, the show did pretty well in New Orleans. And I took the show all over the country at fairs and festivals and other street performing places. And, but when I got to Boulder, it did not do well. Because Boulder, at the time, in the early 90s and also in the, in the 80s, was the juggler's capital of the world. And there were all these amazing jugglers here. You could walk into the CU Fieldhouse when they used to allow people to just open to, it used to be open to the public. And anyone could just come in and practice whatever they were practicing. And it was a place where all these great jugglers would practice, some of the top in the world. And some of them had shows on the mall. And I was just another juggler compared to all these amazing jugglers, you know. And I had to do something different. And I had always been into geography. And the show I developed was something that really um, um, was so much fun for me to do. And um, asking people their zip code and telling them where they come from and uh, something I never get tired of, and here I am 21 years later. When did you start putting the zip codes in, and, and what, like, it was, what sparked that? Well, it's a, it's a story that I feel like I don't even know if I want it to be publicized any more than I have already. The story was that I didn't actually think of the concept. When I did, a, I did a juggling show in New Orleans, right before I moved here, um, in, in Jackson Square in the French Quarter, I do a juggling show, and people are putting money in my hat. A little girl comes up to me. She might have been maybe 12 years old. And she says, I saw an act where you give this guy your zip code and he can tell you where you live. And it, what bothered me was, it, I was a, into ge two things, geography and numbers. And it was like the perfect thing for me. But I didn't want to do it because someone was already doing it. But I decided to just do something that would make my show a little bit different from the juggling act. And um, later I found out that there was a zip code act, but it was a magic act. It was not a memory act. And um, anyway, but it was sort of like this... Uh, it was a circumstance that led to me becoming the zip code man that it was sort of it wasn't like I had this eureka moment of thinking of the idea mm -hmm. and so, so it was always it, 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 there was always sort of like yeah what was that? Um, so this little girl said something and, and it triggered and then so that little girl is responsible for my career basically <laughs> And whoever the magician was, who, who, if that magician is the originator, apparently that's, you know, it, it's in a way, it, there's something I like about the story is that, you know, that a, a little girl, you know, that, 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 you know, or whoever, people can have major influences. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what position they are, in, according to some um, idea of what status is, you know, it's like, a little girl could say something to me and mm. it'll change my life. Mm. That could happen. Mm. Well, the mouths of the apes. Yeah. Uh, so then, was it just like one, two, three? And you no, 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 no. It was a lot of work and a lot of studying. And I had been traveling for many years. And 
when I, and then when, when, especially when I started memorizing the zip codes by getting the zip code directory, I would travel a lot. And when I would travel, I would always make sure I remember what is where, you know, whatever town I'm in, what is a restaurant here. We're, but I always did that, but this time I did it in a way that was very conscious, you know, very deliberate. And, you know, th you know, so no matter where I was, whether I was in some town in Colorado or some place in upstate New York, wherever, you know, I would be really studying and paying attention to what was there. And so after years of studying the zip code directory and traveling around, um, you know, I had all this knowledge about America and also other countries too. So when you tra can we talk a little bit about the traveling? I mean, when you travel, are you hopping around from place to place? Are you um, staying for a season? How does it's Boulder always to that? okay? And in Boulder, the, the the off season is November through February, and I would always travel in, during that time in the winter. And I would sometimes go in my car and drive someplace, sometimes within the country, like it could be California, which I've done for a few winter, different, different winters. Um, one time I got a gig in Florida, um, or I might go to Hawaii, or then sometimes I would go outside the country, like Australia, spent a winter there once, and New Zealand, one winter was there. Um, do you like to travel? Yeah, I do. I, um, I got sick of it, believe it or not. I never thought that could happen to me because traveling was the thing I loved more than anything. But I got really, my last big trip a couple of years ago was to India and I got really sick. And after that, the last thing I wanted to do was go anywhere. And that was actually two and a half years ago or more than that. I can't, and I haven't hardly gone anywhere except for maybe a few gigs in different parts of the country. Uh, but since then, yeah, I just haven't had the urge to go anywhere. How does Boulder compare with other places in the United States? What I like about, why have you made this your home? Okay, what, what I like about Boulder is there is the mall, is the Pro Street Mall, there's a quiet quality to it where the kind of show I do, you can't have too much noise and aggressiveness around around me. It's like New Orleans was a place where I learned to be a street performer and I had to be very dynamic and aggressive, you know, juggling fire on a tall unicycle, being a big attention getter. But what I like about Boulder is I could, you know, I could be quite, sort of a quiet performer that's not so aggressive. The kind of show I do is not really a spectacle exactly, it, like the way I used to be on this tall unicycle with fire torch. It's, it's more quiet and I like that about it. And it's like this place in the country where people are from everywhere else, someplace else. And so that's one, that's, those are two reasons I like the show. I like doing my show here. And there are a lot of reasons I like Boulder. It's like whatever I'm interested in, whether it's yoga or um, martial arts or whatever, or, or outdoor sports, it's right here and there are people who are into that here. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where you could, um, whatever it is, it, it's a learn, it's like the whole place is like, it's almost like the whole place is like a college in some way. It's like a, an informal uh, school where I have time to practice whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's juggling or whatever. Because you know you don't have to spend time in traffic, you know, going places. You can. It's a place to develop things, mm -hmm. and that's where I develop the show, and mm -hmm. it's where I like I like to be most of the year. Interesting. You know, I we just weren't. What's that? The beauty. Yeah. Oh, and there's one thing I love is I love the mountains. You know, I love being outside, and I love mountains, and yeah, and hike. I've hiked a lot, and I just like, yeah, I like outdoor, I like trees, and the sun. The sun, yeah, yeah. I like, yeah, I like the out the outdoor sports, and also the way people eat here. It's easy to eat healthy here. You know, I like that there is. Um, 
there's sort of this health conscious strive for higher quality that I like about it. Whereas New Orleans was sort of this get drunk, uh, noisy drunk. Uh, you know, it was. Um, hey, um, can I pause one second? Yeah. So, what, um, what initially got you in, interested in busking? I was um, a street bef- no, I was a um, college student at Tulane University in New Orleans, and um, juggling was w- and unicycling were my hobbies at the time, or two of my hobbies. And um, I was really impressed with some of the performances I saw in Jackson Square. Um, some of the jugglers who would come into town would have these shows where they weren't just good jugglers, but they were really good entertainers. And they were funny, they were uh, great with the audience, and they uh, performed at Jackson Square. And um, then I would talk to them afterwards and found out that they actually made their living doing shows by traveling around the country performing. And that I was blown away by that, that people could do that. And I had this idea that I'd like to develop my juggling and be able to do what they're doing. And, um, yeah, I'm thinking of this one guy, this Vietnamese guy named Tin Fu, great juggler, who was also a great performer. And, um, and so I then went to summer school at the University of Colorado at Boulder and to study chemistry. And um, I would come down to the mall at night and see some of the jugglers that were practicing at the field house perform on the mall. And these people were even better than the jugglers in New Orleans. Uh, they were some of the best in the world. Famous group called Air Jazz. And, um, the did they start off here, or did they yeah, they they were from here. They're all, or as far as I know, and they um, they were amazing. And this guy named Jimmy Crisco, who was both an amazing juggler and hilariously funny, just great. And there were some other jugglers that um, you know they they had this lifestyle of of practicing all day in the field house and then coming down to the mall to perform. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. And when I was in my senior year, or when I was about my junior year of, between my junior year and senior year of college, I, um, I had this idea I want to be a street performer, but I didn't know how to do it. And, um, and basically I would come down to, the, to Jackson Square every weekend in my, during my senior year of college and try shows and eventually I got enough of a show that when I graduated from college I could make a living performing in the French Quarter as a juggler. And so that was basically how I started. So did you ever use your college degree? Well, I majored in anthropology and, and did all the pre-med stuff, almost went to medical school, but I never used my degree except, you know, I found, what I found the Greek degree was good for was, let's say I, in New Orleans I got in trouble sometimes in street, street performing uh, where police would throw me in jail. And it seemed to be in my favor to say I graduated from Tulane University. And so it, I used, I think I, there was something that respected in, about that, but I never directly used my degree. I was always a street performer, always entertained. Mm-hmm. That's always been what I did. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, the, so what kind of what, other street performers and you are the people who tend to towards busking on the same type or same profile I mean, do you have to have a certain kind of something well, to do that? Well, they're all very different. They could all be very different types of people. But I guess there, there has to be a certain amount of nerve to go out and try it. And there's a sort of independent quality where 
you're not exactly a leader, but you're not exactly a follower. Or you're not one of these, not a leader or a follower, you're the, the doing this independent thing. And so I think there, that type would gravitate That 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 sort of independent type would gravitate toward street performing, but within that there are so many varieties of people with very many different backgrounds. Um, so. So what um, what's required? I mean, I would assume that just discipline, just constantly working on. A show and improving it. Being well, that's what I just do. Is I have things I like, like juggling and my memory act. I just keep practicing and keep getting better at it, and and keep getting better at performing. And um, some people have shows where there's no technical skill involved. There's just sort of this. Uh, it's comedy. It's. Um, but I always I always admired performers that had both skill and were funny. And that was how I wanted to be, where I had really good juggling talent, but and also a good connection with the audience. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I have so many questions, but we could be here all night. Mm -hmm. I want to do that for you. Let's see. Um. So, t you want to talk a little bit about? how the Pearl Street Mall has changed in terms of the talent down there? Well, um, or has it been pretty steady? Well, back in the 80s and 90s, there was a little bit better talent because people would actually come here to practice juggling because there were all these people to practice with who were on this high bar and it sort of spontaneously became the juggler's capital of the world or of the United States. And so there was this amazing amount of talent back then. And there was also some really good magicians like Johnny Fox and, um, and people who, I've heard of people that I never met, but they told me about them, some amazing mimes. And um, I heard the guy who started Cirque du Soleil used to perform down here. And I mean, um, but, but but there's still a lot of really good talent here. And there's a lot of not so good talent. That's the thing about street performing is that anyone could be on the street and, and whether it's a lot of talent or not. It, in a way, that's something I like about it, but it, it could also be frustrating that there's people make a judgment about street performing based on something that's not good. But. Um, I'd say uh, back then there was more, on the average, more juggling talent. Um, but um, there's still really good shows here. Do you think, that, and what, did that have something to do with this field house? Yeah, the field house was, I don't want to blame anyone, but it used to be open to the public. And, and that, in that field house, you would see not only some of the top jugglers, but there were martial artists, there were um, freestyle frisbee people, there were dancers, um, people who were practicing all kinds of things. It was like this place where whatever people's practice was, they would go freestyle in a way, you know, freestyle way, just do it. And it was an environment that was really nice to have. Available. But Available. Not, it wasn't a stage. This is the stage here. Right, right. That was the practice area. And it was great that to have that place that you can walk in there for like, for free actually at the time. And you could just practice. Mm. That's so cool. And it was a great thing to have. Yeah. And um, an opportunity to be surrounded by all that. Yeah, and it was a way, it was a good, it was a good thing to meet, way to meet people and yeah, there's, they, they, they locked it to, they don't open it up to the public anymore. And not, not that I'm complaining about that, really, but that's, that was a nice thing at the time. Well, it created this. It created this situation that Boulder was the juggler's capital of the world in the 1980s. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, what do you think, 
you know, are you, so you live here? Yeah. Most part? And, most part. Um, you know, what do you think of Boulder just in general in terms of people that you find? Well, you already kind of talked about that. Big, large diversity. You talked about that. Well, it's, it's, um, in some ways it's not a large diversity. It's, it's, um, it, I, I kind of, something I liked about the early 90s when I first got here, or, or in the mid 80s, when I was, I just went to summer school in 83, and what I liked about it was it had a more hippie quality to it. And there, but, but now they, you know, I guess that the, when times when there's hippies, it causes all their problems, and they have, they don't allow, the, the the kind of vagabond like scene that there used to be, and there's sort of like a it feels more antiseptically clean here. That um, and do I like that? Um, I I guess I have mixed feelings about that. I um, you know I could see people not liking a certain element that the punks and hippies would bring, but, you know, it's also, um, I don't know, it, it's, maybe there's, it seems to be a, um, it's very clean. I, I don't know what to, I, I can't say I, 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 there's something I'm not in love with about it, but it's clean and it has a more comfortable feel in a certain way. But I like intrigue and, the, you know, like, like the New Orleans, the French Quarter was this mystery, magical place. And I think this very street-like element of it was was made it a magical place, even though there's all kinds of other things that go along with it, like riffraff and hustling and, you know, and that's not good. And, and you know, um, it's, um, no, it's, it's an interesting thing to, what, what, you know, is the environment better now that it's more controlled and, and cleaner? Um, I can't go with, I'm not, I'm not totally on board with that. Um, Do you think you would, um, if you were, how old were you when you got here? 28. So if you were arriving here now as a 28 year old, do you think that would affect your future as a performer? Do you think you would be, you know, as good or where you are or? It's hard to say. And I don't even know that the, the kind of change of having a clean, conservative environment as opposed to a you know people coming in in vans and you know, living in their vans and um, I don't know that that really would make I, I don't know that that would make that much of a difference because basically I have my things that I'm interested in whether it's juggling or whatever and I'm going to focus on that and I don't know that that's really that important these external things. So would you call yourself an introvert or an extrovert? I'd say uh, I'm an introvert most of the time, but at the same time, the thing I love to do more than anything is entertain. So it's a paradox. Hmm. I could entertain, you know, I wouldn't surprise, you know, I've been entertaining in Boulder alone for 21 years, and then like six years before that and so and I'm not tired of it and so there's something extroverted about that so um, it's both at the same time what would you say are the um, <coughs> pros and cons in your opinion I mean about your lifestyle what or maybe you could just describe kind of what's a typical day for you here in Boulder in well, the summertime <coughs> well I am um, I live right um, three blocks from the Boulder Zen Center, and I go there most mornings. And and I'm uh, and I also live just six blocks from a yoga place that I like to train at. And then I also train in Tai Chi, martial art, and 
um, and have all these other practices like juggling and um, and things having to do with my show and and Boulder is a place where I could spend time practicing and developing and where I could bring all these different activities into an art form, into performance. And so do you, you practice every day and then yeah. come down to the mall in the afternoon? Exactly, yeah, yeah. And um, to go out to eat? Or? Yeah, I, I, like, I like some of the restaurants here, yeah. Um, I like um, some restaurants I like are Leaf, the vegetarian restaurant. And this new one opened up, the Native Foods Cafe in the, in the 29th Street Mall. I like Ras Casas, Ethiopian restaurant, which I haven't been to in a while. I like um, this Indian restaurant, Jai Ho, that's on Pearl, near to 28th and Pearl. It's really good. Yeah. Um, I like. Um, I like, let's see, no, there are a lot of, I like the food here. There is so much, I mean, for a little town, the fact that you can get sushi, I like to go to Zanmai. Um, for a little town, you can get such a variety. You know, I like this Bombay Bistro that opened up, that, 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 that's right here on a um, uh, block from the mall. I like, um, no, I like that, you know, you can get so many different kinds of food, and it's this little town. Um, so, I, um, yeah, it's more. It seems more um, eclectic and diverse food-wise. Yeah. Since the last, you know, twenty years. Yeah, ago. it's definitely one of the better food towns, yeah. especially for its size. I mean, I love Chicago. I think that's my all-time favorite. And Houston, believe it or not, is a great restaurant place. But Boulder. Yeah, I never complained about the food here. And do you um, do you cook or? I I, I mainly eat out. I mainly eat out, yeah. even though I if I had a bigger kitchen, I'd probably want to cook. But it's it's really just because I live in this tiny little place and Perfect. yeah yeah. Um, and then I just wanted to you know maybe ask you a couple other things. Um, Um, just your family or your gene, like how you were brought up, and, and did, do you think that that had anything to do with who you be, who you've become? Which is kind of a rare thing. I mean, to be a busker on the mall. And yeah, I never expected to be a busker. I always thought when I started busking, it was something I was doing while I figured out what I was going to do. And it, the fact that it's gone on for 27 years is something I'd be surprised at if I was 22 when I just started, that I wouldn't believe that, um, that it would go on this long. But um, your question was, was I brought, no, I wasn't brought up to do this. I, uh, or is there something that, in how you were brought up that did kind of lead you to this? Well, for some reason, I loved juggling. When I was a kid, and no, I, was, I was fascinated by juggling. I like geography. I, um, I, it was a circumstance really where I'm in New Orleans going to school there. No intention of becoming a performer. I was um, pre-med. Um, and it, things happened where I was intrigued with the performing at the time. And I just never thought that it would last this long. It wasn't anything I thought I would that would go on for so long. I just, at that time, I was interested in, uh, you know, when I first saw people riding unicycles in the park in New Orleans, and I was like, wow. I was just, it was never, there was never any idea that I would uh, become an entertainer. And um, I so never, it was really just a fluke that you wound, yeah. you know, wound up at Tulane and. Yeah. Yeah, I, here I am in New Orleans. It's, it, yeah, it was basically an environment where the thing I was interested in at that time was that there were these cool street performers and that I might be able to create a street show. I was never had this ambition of becoming an entertainer. 
never. So were you just open to it and just going with the flow and there wasn't a lot of pressure from family or wherever so you could just kind of... Well, there was... I saw entertaining as a way, at least temporarily, that I could make a living immediately after college and do it in a way that was uh, that was fun and interesting and that I thought it was the coolest thing that these street performers could actually make money doing it and pay rent and, and live off doing that. That was... Um, you know, and it was this really new, amazing thing that I could go out and do shows all day and have this pile of one dollar bills that, you know, that could buy food and pay the rent and I could have a car and do live pretty simply, but live, you know? And it was, um, it, but it was always this thing that I, I never thought it was anything that I was going to do for that long. And here I am. You know, you've known me f when I first got here back in 92. And, you know, back then I, it was just something I'm doing for right now. And today it's just something I'm doing for right now. And it might very well be that I do it for another 50 years. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not tired of it. Mm. I still love performing, right? and I'm still developing my show and mm. always focusing on improving my act. And and I don't have any. Um, I guess I don't see anything else I'd rather do. So I don't hear any anxiety about your future or. No. Um, have you ever had any students? Have you ever taught anybody? Well, you know, one time back about, it might have been 15 years ago, there was, a, there, was a high, there was a high school called New Vista High School up here in Boulder that's more of an artsy kind of school. And, this, and they, do a, they have this program where the kids in the high school pick mentors. And so one kid might pick, like, let's say, a surgeon to be his mentor. Another kid might pick like a airline pilot or something. This kid, his name is Eliav. Do you know him? Yeah, Eliav Cohen. He picks the zip code man. And uh, and so he uh, asked me if I wanted to be his mentor because he wanted to be a street performer. And he was a he liked magic and. Uh, and I said, sure. So I went to a meeting in the school with his mother and the school guidance counselor. And I basically supported him in developing his show. And, and, and that was, I guess, the closest to having a student that I ever got. I never had a... I never... I mean, I've taught people how to juggle and stuff, but I've never really um, put myself out as a teacher. Is that something you could see yourself doing, or...? Um, possibly. I don't... It's possible. Mm -hmm. If I have something that I... The thing is, though, most of what I do is self-taught. And so I don't know that I'd want to... Yeah, I don't know that I... I can't say that I came from a lineage of teachers, mm -hmm. since I kind of... I mean, it was self-taught, even though some of it was inspired by other people. Or it was, in, or I might have gotten ideas from other people, um, but I didn't go to school to do it. So I don't know whether I w would teach, but I'm not close to the possibility. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about other performers and what you gleaned from your shows, or learn? Well, I, I learn a lot from other performers. I mean, you know, I learn a lot. Um, I've gotten a lot from other, you know, like the fact that I had to develop a new kind of show when I came to Boulder had to do with that there were these, all these other amazing jugglers that, first of all, jugglers that, there were jugglers that here that really inspired me to become a good juggler, you know, seeing people do things that I didn't even know were possible. And so they inspired me as a juggler, and they also put pressure on me to evolve in a different direction. 
So it's sort of like I'm evolving with the other performers. There was this performer named Kenny Lightfoot in Boulder, who's a magician, who did a trick with numbers that got me thinking about performing with numbers. And you know, he did this thing called Magic Squares. And he was someone who really inspired me and like showed me how you could go in some totally new direction, you know. And so, and you know, just recently I got back into juggling, partly because I saw this juggler here, who's performing actually my pipe play right now, who um, who d has this really nice torch routine. The way the moves flow into one move flows into another move with such gracefulness that it inspired me to get back into juggling. And so it's always been, I've always learned something from other performers. And it's as if even though in a sense I'm competing with them for time and space, in one hand we got to share space, but there's also the fact that I'm learning from them and they're probably learning something from me at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so how is it to perform? <laughs> well, you saw my last show just now and I love, I love it. There's, not, there's, there's something, it's something that if I had an environment where there were nonstop crowds all the time, I would think I, I might be, be performing 365 days a year, but I do need some rest. I, I, I mean, no matter how much you love something, you have to take breaks. But um, I don't see myself getting tired of entertaining. And do you, do you I could. I could go on and on, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you worry about your body? Kind of, you're a very strong person. Yeah. I've never had any health problems. Mm -hmm. And I've always been in like perfect shape. I mean, I practice yoga and Tai Chi and I've always done some sort of fitness thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm relying on something that is not, might not be permanent. It might not be, you know, it, it's, um, but, um, yeah, but it also could be that I'll be like this for indefinitely. I don't know. And, um, but it's the, f the fact is I'm not thinking, I, I, I have no, I, I have no concept of retirement. I don't have, I don't, I want to keep performing. As long as I breathe, I want to perform. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and I guess I'll keep on training and practicing and um, and yeah. I mean, yeah. The fact is, we have bodies and stuff, you know. And and um, and I guess I don't. People might think I'm a little bit not really seeing reality in the sense that I'm just going to plan to just keep street performing or perform in some way or another, but that's what I plan to do today anyway. Yeah. And Yeah, who knows what um, tomorrow brings anyway. Yeah, you don't know and uh, it's like, yeah, I, um, I just plan to keep, well, at least I'm going to perform today. That's all I know. Well, I mean, when you're so accomplished at learning things and excelling, you know, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. probably at some comfort level with, well, I could just map this on to something else, you know? I could just what? Map, map on to something else. I mean, if you, for some reason, woke up tomorrow and, and couldn't juggle, for example. I would somehow, I, I, I guess I... I it's still perform. Something, perform. there would be some other way. I don't know what it would be, but it would be something else. And, but I... I, I like the challenge, the idea, you know, like there's this guy named Francis Brunn, who's a, one of the world's best jugglers, who's probably in his 80s right now. And I don't see why I can't do what he's doing. And, um, you know, to keep, you know, yeah, I can't, I, can't ev I, I can't even, I don't even know how to project out that far in the future. I don't know what I'm going to be interested in tomorrow. And it's always been that way. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, really. But it's strange that here I am, 
27 years after I started performing and I'm still performing. And it's always, I really don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Mm. But I kind of, <laughs> I, it's hard to imagine that I would not want to entertain. 27 years, you got pretty good at it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I had a little bit of practice, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, um, let's see. Is there anything, there's so many different avenues we can go down, but... Any famous people you want to talk about, or have you? Well, some some people who I found inspiring. My my number one idol is Rod Serling, the creator of the Twilight Zone. Same. And and he was someone kind of like the the these jugglers who were not only really good but really funny. He was someone who was not just imaginative but can connect with his audience. His show was so meaningful. And I was so engaged watching him when I was a kid and his show, The Twilight Zone. And he, you know, I didn't know what, I, it's like he was someone I would say is, a, is an inspiration, someone who, um, um, if I would want to be like someone, it would be like him. Do you think he opened a door for you in terms? Well, he he has, his show is all about you know transcending the boundaries of imagination or whatever you know, transcending um, what we think is possible, and in any way, shape, and form. And so, did he open doors? It's hard to tell, but. I like that direction of going beyond something, thinking beyond what we know. Mm -hmm. that, that there's always a beyond to what we know and that there's always, you know, that, that what we know is this little tiny, what we think we know, even if we're right, is this little tiny thing in a vast sea of infinity. And, and that he could be in, in entertainment and convey that message. And that would be what I would, whatever form of entertainment, it would be that. Um, have you ever, um, I mean, I know you play Go. What are some things, other ways besides entertaining that help you kind of test reality? Well, I've, uh, when I take trips places, I go to some very out of the way places and I write stories about them. I have a, wrote a book of stories and I've gone to places like West Africa and um, Southeast Asia, various out of the way places, been to Russia, been to um, Iceland, been to the southern tip of Argentina. I mean, I go, I, I kind of geographically go limits and investigate different cultures and different ideas and um, and that's one way. Mm. And do you actually, you know, find people to be with and yeah. lots of time? I, I always look for like various shamans and um, healers and um, uh, people who have something to teach me. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's great about Boulder is they could be right here and that I don't have to go anywhere, even though sometimes it's nice to go places and, and see things I wouldn't find here, but it's, um, yeah, it's mainly there's, there are people who have things to teach. Mm -hmm. So to me, it sounds like you really develop, have, have developed a life of the body and the mind. Yeah. It's kind of, what about the spirit? Well, um, Practicing Zen and yoga and stuff like that, it aims to, aims towards that, and, um, and it's hard to measure spiritual growth. I mean, it's not a measurable thing, but there could be moments of 
there can be, I've discovered that sometimes these practices can lead to things that are not visible from people outside the practices. And it, um, and it's, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to like put myself, like as far as being a teacher is, I don't think I'm ready to be, put myself out as someone who knows how to develop spiritually. I, I'm, I'm exploring different things and I don't know, I don't claim to know anything or have, but I'm exploring things and it's in, what's interesting to me is that all these different avenues of exploration, whether it's Peruvian shamanism or Zen meditation or whatever, uh, there are things to discover in the exploration of it, but I don't claim to know very much. So if you were a doctor, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you know, you've had, you have a lifestyle that allows you a lot of time for right. these pursuits. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, do you feel like, I don't know, I don't know what the question is. But well, no, but it sounds like you have a good question that, that is based on not like, it's not like, like someone is giving you a script. It sounds like you have an, uh, something you're curious about. Well, it's just, you know, there's, there's, most of us are, you, or you said it earlier in the interview, you know, leaders or followers. Yeah. And then there are these group of people that are really fringe. Yeah, they're not leaders yeah. and not followers. And, I, and I, I don't know if it's always entertainers, or not, but I think certainly entertainers can fit into that group. And that, that real desire to explore, get outside the box. Or, mm -hmm. And, and, then give back. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, who would, where would we be if we didn't have these people? Really? You know? Right. It's really good to have people who check things out. And create and fun, Yeah. And, you know. Yeah, no, I, I feel like there's something to contribute by being someone who investigates and doesn't go on the word of, let's say, the mainstream media or, or parents or other people or, and checks things out. I think that it's important to do that. To find out what you know, you know, to, to, to explore and find out. And sometimes exploring is dangerous and take a risk. But if, uh, but it's sort of like I want to explore things. I'm not. I want to find. If I want to find out for myself and, and yeah, and I hope it. It's something that I could bring back to other people in a way, like whether it's a story about something or a discovery. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Do you connect with people other than, you know, I mean, your shows are obviously, I see you yeah. talking with a lot of people at yeah. times. And you know a lot of people on Boulder. So is that important to you or is it? It is important to me. Mm -hmm. that I mean that I connect with people in my show? Well, just in general, social life. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I like being able to connect with various types of people, whether they're, you know, like I'm in different kinds of communities, whether it's the community of people that do yoga or play the game of Go or whatever, or street performing community. I want to connect with, I want to be versatile in that if they're humans or, or even if they're beyond human, whatever, um, that, I could, that I could have a, some kind of relationship with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... Uh, well, is there anything I haven't talked about that you'd like to... If, um, does any question you have, I um, uh, can't think of anything right now. Maybe just tell a couple of stories about a couple of performances on the mall. Some okay. highlights. Last year, I was doing a show on the mall. And a girl gives me her zip code. And it was zip code I recognized as the zip code for a little town in Nebraska. And what I recognized about the town, what I remember about it was, 
it was a zip code I had missed in a show many years earlier. The show was at a um, at a company gathering, uh, uh, like a, like a special event for a company in a. Um, I th might have taken place in a hotel, and um, and in that show that I did for this company, it might have been 1996 or something like that, like, you know, a long time ago, maybe 16 ye years ago, 15 years ago. In that show, everything went wrong. I got not only that zip code wrong, but other zip codes wrong. I accidentally insulted somebody. Um, my juggling tricks didn't work. I dropped everything. And I felt so bad about the show that I didn't ask the person who hired me to pay me at the end. I just left after the event and never asked for that check ever. And that was over 15 years earlier. And that was, anyway, so she gives me a zip code of Genoa, Nebraska. And, um, and anyway, so I remembered the zip, the zip code, and I remember having missed it. It was one of those things in that show that I missed. And I also remember walking away, not even asking for the check, thinking I don't deserve the money because I did such a horrible performance. And anyway, so I have this girl from Genoa, Nebraska on my map. And after the show, she brings with her her dad and she introduces me to her dad and she says and her dad says says to me you did a show for us 15 years ago uh, where we were a pharmaceutical company and you did a show for us I said uh, yeah I remember that and he says he says to me I believe you did not get paid I said well yeah I felt like I did such a horrible show I felt like I didn't deserve to get paid and I left without getting paid. Then he says, well, I'm going to pay you right now. He takes out his wallet, puts a $100 bill in there. Then he takes another $100 bill, puts it in the hat. Then he takes another $100 bill, puts it in the hat. Then he takes another $100 bill and puts it in the hat. Then he takes another $100 bill and puts it in the hat. And then he says, thank you for your performance. And then I hugged him. And I ended up getting paid for that performance last year on the mall for a show that I did in Denver over 15 years ago. That's great. <laughs> did he seek you out? I don't know. I don't think so. It just happened. It just happened. Wow. And you want to hear n another really weird story? Of course. And I kind of worry... What, and it was a story that was the most, probably one of the most touching stories that I've, I've had as a performer. Mm -hmm. I finish a show on the mall and a guy comes up to me after, it was that way after I had finished my show. I had cleaned everything up and I finished. Comes up to me and gives me a $20 bill. I said, well, thank you. I, I, said, well, what, what, I said, what's this for? And he says to me, he, gave, he says to me, he gives me a zip code, he, sa he gives me a zip code, 15963, he says. I said, that's Winber, Pennsylvania. And uh, he says, my dad was, had recently died just last week, he says. And when he was on his deathbed, I was holding his hand, he was dying, and, he, and he, my dad says to me, do you know that guy on the mall who does the zip codes? And I said, well, what about him, Dad? He said, he knew our zip code. And then he passed away. And anyway, There are things that happen that, you know, that are, yeah. 
I mean, like the little girl, right? Little girl, yeah, yeah. Something very small can be something very big. Yeah. Wow. And it's sort of like, um, you know, and like being an entertainer, it might not seem like I'm Barack Obama or something, but, mm. it, you know, like, it could, it, you know, something small can create a major effect. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's mm. a great story. Anything else you want to say? No, no, well, we're just at the end of our tape. It's perfect. Okay.